Hello, everyone. Um, it's great to be here. Thank you very much for attending. I'm happy to talk about spherene today. And spherene is something new. So the new is characterized by the fact that you witness its beginning, or you are a contemporary of its beginning. Whereas the not new has or seems to have been here all the time, like the STL file format, for example. So I'm going to be telling you a little story about beginnings. I received this rock from my grandmother when I was 14 years old. And she told me it came from outer space. She was a ladies' tailor all her life, and she had acquired this when she was visiting my parents in Austin, Texas, helping with my newborn self back then. Years later, it became clear that this rock stems from an impact, an asteroid that created Chesapeake Bay and was hurled outwards. I mean, it was like a bedrock that melted, was hurled outwards, left the atmosphere, re-entered. You can actually see the traces of the re-entry, it came back down like this, and fell into a swamp near Austin, which is where my grandmother bought it. Now, if you look at things, if you, if you want to understand things, you might look at extreme points, like understand architecture by looking at how the wall meets the window. In the trajectory, you might want to look at the apex. Now, just below the apex of this rock's trajectory is Huntsville, Alabama. And this is where my parents created another sort of impact that somewhat directly led to me being here today. <laughs> what was my father doing there? He was a mathematician working at NASA on the Apollo Soyuz project, which was which had the aim of the two antipodes of the Cold War area, the Soviets and the Americans, to have a, a spacecraft meet in space. Now, he was calculating the trajectories, the orbital mechanics of this. But what's interesting is that the, the visual appearance, the view, the technicality of this thing was dominated by another thing that is based in testosterone, because the Russians had, had it be let known that there is no way that your American spaceship is going to enter our Russian spaceship, right? And so someone came up with this beautiful solution, an a-hierarchical geometry, a philosophical geometry where those two things meet with three braces from each side, right? And this solved that problem. Now, I have never seen such a mechanism or such a principle in nature. And what it tells me is that while nature is a good inspiration, mathematics, ideas, understanding of things, recombination of knowledge, association of seemingly unrelated facts can lead to things that are mathematically beautiful and even seem to be correct in a way. And that's also how spherene came to be. It started with paper models I did when I was still an artist and ended up in this company being founded and again us being here. So what is spherene? Spherene is the opposite of the sphere, hence the name. It's a new type of minimal surface a certain, that which we discovered and for which we wrote the algorithm to create. It is always surface conformal, it's aperiodic, and it's isotropic, truly isotropic. It is a metamaterial, and because of, because of its isotropicity, it behaves like bulk material, but it has a variable density, it has configurable stiffness, configurable geometry, configurable interface to the surroundings, configurable thickness, it is predictable, we'll get to that later, and it is extremely efficient. It's based on a proprietary algorithm 
is computed on the cloud, is modular and accessible via an API. And it's no joke either. So this is a, a satellite bracket uh, that we did for the European Space Agency that withstood all of the 1,000 Gs that we threw at it. Now, for those of you who don't know, what is a minimal surface? Again, let's talk about analyzing and understanding, understanding things. If you look at a sphere, you want to understand the sphere, you would measure its curvature in two perpendicular directions. And you would see that those curvatures are, equally, are equal and they are positive. So that's a sphere. If those two directions that you measure are non-curved, flat, you get a plane. Now, if those two perpendicular curves are bent in the same amount, but opposite sign, then you have a hyperbolic surface in general, and if, if, if the amount is the same for every point, you have a minimal surface. So you see there's a, a close connection between minimal surfaces and spheres. And obviously, the minimal surface has something ideal. It's, it's, it's a minimal energy state, for example. Now you've known, you've know, you, all, you all know the, the, the TPMS, the triply periodic minimal surfaces like the gyroid. What we have found we call ADMS, adaptive density minimal surface. And probably the most obvious comparisons are shown on this slide. On one hand, if you put a TPMS into a shape that's not a cube, you will always get irregular outer ends because the TPMS re uh, repeats inside of a cube or inside of every space-filling polyhedron, in fact. Whereas the spherine geometry fills every shape in a correct way, so to say. And you see that also in the way how it ends in terms of angle. So in a spherine, you always have a perpendicular entry or a per perpendicular ending, or roughly perpendicular ending of the surface where you can insert forces without generating uh, stress concentrations, and you have a more or less regular distance between those endings, whereas in the TPMS, this is depending on the outer shape, as I said. And you also see it in mechanical tests, where you can see that the spherine in the second, oops, you can see that the spherine in the second part of the compression, this was a, a ductile material, um, had roughly half the deformation at the same force than the gyroid sample, which had the same amount of material used and the same genus, the same amount of cells, you could say. So in order to kind of round this up a little bit, this first part, what are spherines? They are inverted spheres, as I said. And you can see that on this diagram, which shows the Gauss map, or you could say the distribution of phase normals, where you can see that the gray distribution is the gyroid. It has peaks because it has to fit into a cube. It has to start on one side in the same manner that it ended on the other, right? So you get more of some directions, whereas the spherine and the sphere they are totally homogeneous. They are kind of rounded off. They are isotropic. Spherines are always dual domain, as are all minimal surface, meaning that they have two spe separate spaces that don't interleave. They, they never meet. You, you can fill it with two different uh, liquids if you want. Spherines are controlled in terms of outer shape, density, thickness, and surface bias, which is the position of the surface, if it's in the center, the ideal position, or moved outwards. They are surface conformal. They follow every geometry that you throw at it. To compute this or this takes the same amount of time, the same amount of effort. Spherines are stochastic. They are based on, 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 on randomness, you could say but still they are regular. You can see that here in this slide where a meaning, meaningful increase in density, a meaningful decrease in feature size 
is actually governed by the same row of numbers that we know from photography from, from, from the, the, the aperture series, right? Based on the square root of two. And this is true for all its features, even down to the triangle, triangle the amount of triangles or the genus. <coughs> they are intuitive to control. There's three main axes. The density, which is volume percentage, how much of how much volume, what's the percentage of volume that you fill from the envelope, then vertical, the thickness of the wall, and left, right, the bias, as I mentioned. And all of this is obviously uh, controlled locally, arbitrarily, or with one value or simulation result, whatever you want. They have very predictable stress and strain behavior that we can see here. So there's a, a, a direct relation between thickness, density, the amount of material, the proportion between uh, the thickness and the genus on the right side. Again, the thickness or the surface bias, how the surface is oriented. You can all foresee what you're going to get in, in however manner that you, you configure the spherine. And it even goes to the point where it is predictable with a formula. So, which again is based on the geometric um, distribution. So, stress is related to strain by this, the strength uh, root of strain, so to say. And we see that when we um, simulate, no, sorry, when we uh, uh, conducted mechanical tests on titanium samples, which yielded those light blue or light color areas, that's the, the spread of the different samples, we were five samples each, and we match it with the, with the theoretical curve, and we could, we could predict the yield point and the break point by the fact that yield is at the equivalent of x equals one, whereas break is at the equivalent of x equals E Euler's number. So there's, again, some mathematical beauty in here. The workflow to create syringe is very simple. Load an envelope, set your requirements, compute it, regardless of the complexity of the part, and support free to print. That's, you're seeing this part here. It was actually just sawn off the base plate. There's no, there's no post-processing whatsoever in, except for me cleaning my hands. <laughs> Maybe should have worn gloves. You can access it today from within Rhino 3D and Grasshopper. Um, install it from the, the package manager, it's very simple. In the works are an integration into NTOP and Autodesk Fusions, can't give a timeline, we're hurrying up, obviously. And to end this, I would like to show you uh, two versions of a little simulation-driven workflow in Grasshopper to create a, a brake pedal. So the overall workflow would be this. We have the creation configuration of the input geometry on the left side, so we have the envelope, we have the, the footrest, we have the the forces set up, the, the pivot points, the fixed parts. Then we have a first block using intact solutions where we simulate the whole envelope, the, 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 the solid body. And inside of this, we, we, um, we clamp the density fields to, the, to, the, to the, uh, the values we want to treat. Then we have in white the spherine computation part where we have in blue um, the controls for density, in yellow for surface bias, in red for thickness, and then in the, in the, the purple part is the, the boundaries, so parts that need to be solid, like for example, the, the, we don't want to have a structure in the footrest which is very thin, and the green on the bottom is a detail which kind of adds 
further geometry to the thing that wasn't uh, contained in the envelope. And then we re-simulate that in the purple part, again with intact solution, clamp the density field again, and then we can feed that back into uh, the spherene generation. So when we talk about timing, we're about at 30 seconds for the initial simulation. We're about one, two, three, four, one, two, three minutes for a spherine. And then uh, maybe five to 10 minutes for, or longer if you kind of increase the resolution of the simulation for the simulation and then so on and so on. So the first version I'm showing is based on adaptive mapping of, of, of simulation results. We start with setting up the simulation, the geometry as we said. We simulate it, we display here um, yield strength of the material. I think we chose the wrong material, it was steel, it doesn't seem to be strong enough. We then generate from this density field here, we generate a first spherine. And we have here a, oh, it's hard to read, a density range from 5.6 to 32. And obviously the 5.6 is too little, right? We don't get enough material um, in this part that is not very, very, very largely or heavily loaded. So we do a second, a second iteration. Again, here we are calculating only the single surface that's much quicker than the, the solid body. And we, we display density on, on the geometry. And we have also changed a little bit the, the transfer function because obviously we need more material in the not dense areas in because of the geometry rather than because of the loads. We then create the solid surface from this um, where we already have also adjusted the thickness of those, those boundaries, the outline, which where obviously the most of the, the, the loads are, or stresses are occurring and we simulate it and we see that we still have some, some very large loading in here in the, in, the, in the curve. So we go back, we adjust the thickness and we add um, again a transfer function and we, we, we request a very thick wall for, for where the loads are very high and we recalculate it and we get a much better result. Now, a second version of this, this workflow is done via an iterative feedback of the simulation, the, the spherine generation, and the re-simulation. So again, we start with a full body, solid body simulation. We take the density field of that solid body, we create a first spherine with a thickness, constant thickness, we then create a second density field where we average the density field from the first simulation and the second simulation and use that to create another spherine. Again here, we're still talking about the same time, kind of uh, generation times. It's a couple of minutes always. We, take an, we do another average of the density field now the two spherine density fields are averaged and create a third version of the geometry and then use that density field to create a very high resolution density field for the thickness and apply that thickness to the same geometry that we had in the second iteration and we get this with drastically reduced stresses all around. So this, this uh, would take probably about an hour to set up and, and uh, an hour to, to uh, execute. And the part is basically printable if you kind of take into account the outer, the outer shapes. So where does that lead us? Well, I think we all should shoot for the moon and I thank you very much for your attention.